a meeting for the Wakefield School Committee. Um, first thing on the agenda is uh, I'm going to ask everyone here to stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is the reading of the Wakefield Public Schools mission statement. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident, lifelong learners who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and cha challenging curriculum, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. At this point in the meeting, we'd like to open up for public comment. Um, if any member of the public wants to address <coughs> the school committee, uh, this is the time to do so. Uh, do we have anyone on Zoom? Going once, going twice. Okay, <laughs> hearing, hearing that there is no public comment, we are now going to close public comments. Next on the agenda is our consent agenda. Do I hear a motion? I move that the school committee approve the minutes of the July 30th, 2024 school committee meeting as presented. Second. Okay, so this goes to a roll call vote. Yes, that was the that was declarative. Yep. I, yep. I thought. Yeah. Roll call vote. Uh, Judy, do you want to? Ms. Quinn. Yes. Mr. Fontanella. Yes. Ms. Gawler. Yes. Dr. Piscadlo. Yes. Mr. Ringo. Yes. <laughs> okay. Next on the agenda is our budget items. Um, for this, I'm going to move, uh, see the floor to, uh, Ms. Bethany. Christine. Yeah. So tonight you have, it's that time of year that we have our final fiscal 24 report for our local budget. So we have um, the last month of 24 and the first month of 25. As you'll see in the financial report for 24, we are having an ending balance of just over $24,000, 24,478. We worked really hard in the accounting office, the staff um, really, um, reviewed all the purchase orders. As you can see, we're only carrying $64,000 worth of purchase orders. Does anyone have any questions on that? So as you know, that money reverts back to the town. <coughs> Excuse me. So for fiscal 25, we have our first report. And we are operating at 52319699. July is a very small month for payrolls, so we um, ha don't have our encumbrances yet for that. Does anyone have any questions on that? And then we have our payrolls. We have a motion for the June and July payrolls. We do. Move that the school committee approve the payroll warrant number 50, number 52A, and number 52B for June fiscal year 24, and payroll warrants number 2 and number 4 for July fiscal year 25 as presented. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, we'll move into a roll call vote. Ms. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Fontanella? Yes. Ms. Colloran? Yes. Dr. Piscadlo? Yes. <clears throat> the next items is that we have three gifts to accept tonight. Um, they are. I don't. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't think Mr. Ingalls voted. Oh, sorry. I think he's entitled. Mr. Ingalls. I would. I would also be a yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we have three gifts to accept tonight, um, all from PTOs. The first one is from the Galvin um, Middle School PTO. Um, I think we have a motion for that. Um, do you want to make a motion for each of the PTOs separately or, or all together? I think we can do one at a time. Okay. Um, so approval of gifts. I move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of 12 LEGO Education Spike Prime sets valued at $4,799.40 from the Galvin Middle School PTO. Second. 
Um, is there any comment? Seeing no comment or questions, uh, open that up to roll call. Ms. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Fontanella? Yes. Ms. Colloran? Yes. Dr. Piscadlo? Yes. Mr. Ringles? Yes. Oh. Great. And we have two more gifts, and these are from the Walton PTO. The first one is for um, the purchase of Red Cats with Flex Mics, which I believe are classroom audio systems. We have a motion. Move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $2,656 from the Walton School PTO for the purchase of two Red Cats with Flex Mics, which are classroom audio systems. Second. Okay, is there any comment? Seeing no uh, comments, uh, we can go to roll call. Ms. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Fontanella? Yes. Ms. Colloran? Yes. Dr. Biscadlo? Yes. Mr. Ingalls? <clears throat> And the last gift is also from the Walton PTO. It's for the purchase of two soccer goals and netting for $3,000. Uh, move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $3,000 from the Walton School PTO for the purchase of two soccer goals and netting. Yeah, I'll second. <laughs> uh, is there any discussion? No, Seeing no discussion, we'll move into a roll call. Yeah, I'm right to my vote. <laughs> Ms. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Fontanella? Yes. Ms. Colloran? Yes. Dr. Piscadlo, yes. Mr. Ringles. Yes. Okay. So that is it for gifts tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the PTOs. Yes. Okay. So moving on to the next item, we're going to move to the superintendent's remarks. Um, so we'll see the floor to the superintendent, Dr. Lyons. Thank you very much. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to take the items out of order. Absolutely. And so I'd like to start off by inviting uh, Principal Webb up to the table to give an update on uh, cell phones at the middle school. And so before she gets started, I can just kind of provide some context of, of the information that's happening, not only around the state, but around the country, right? And so the Surgeon General has again reissued his report indicating um, their, the, the concerns nationally around the effects of social media and cell phone use on um, adolescent children. And so uh, and schools around the country, I, I want to say there's eight states at this point, that are kind of coming out um, with very strict regulations around cell phone use or access to cell phones in schools. So that's what's happening nationally. Um, and, and we too are kind of concerned of the effects that, that kind of cell phones have on middle school kind of teaching and learning, but also on how kids are able to interact and how it takes kind of a lot of their time and attention. So this past year, we um, piloted the Yonder Pouches, and Meg gave an update in May, but she wanted to come back and just kind of give a, a, a quick summary of, of where they're at and what the plan is for this year. Meg? Thank you. Great. Good to see you all. Um, so yeah, we're at that time of year we're planning to um, reopen school soon. Um, and so this is certainly one of the operational pieces that we've been talking about. You have a clicker right by your hand. Thank you. Um, and so exactly what Doug was talking about, we, we've been, um, of course, we adopted the pilot much due to all the research and um, concern nationally and locally around students and cell phones. Um, I pulled a quote from Commissioner, former Commissioner Riley, um, which he sent out to principals kind of at the start of the grant process for the pilot, um, just around how cell phones um, and access the unfettered access to um, all of the information that students have access to um, is not only distracting during school, but as Doug was mentioning, um, more and more is, is shown to be um, likely the cause of a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the um, uh, social emotional health issues that we're encountering um, in this age group. Um, I also included a picture of a book that, full disclosure, I've not read yet, but several parents have emailed me um, this book as a recommendation. So I don't I see some of you maybe have read it or are reading it. Um, which I think is a large part now. I know I'm in parent circles and principal circles, um, and it's a much talked about book that kind of addresses a lot of the same uh, concerns and issues. And so it's certainly something that we're really glad that we are at the forefront in terms of um, Desi's um, efforts to kind of just explore what are some of our options in terms of supporting students um, in this space. So um, this is a slide that might look familiar to you when we first um, we're here explaining the grant that we applied for and received. We talked about some of the things at the Galvin that we were seeing. 
Um, we had a meeting with families that was included Jen Hart um, and Andrew Cedroni, two of our counselors, um, around why they felt it was important for us to think about being a part of some of these efforts to address uh, the issue of cell phones in schools. So we talked a bit about uh, the distraction that is caused by just access to cell phones during the school day, um, cyberbullying issues that we were dealing with, um, both activity during the school day and outside of school hours, um, and then a lot of anxiety issues that more and more now when we read research we see do have some relationship with um, access to social media. Uh, but we had a hunch some of this was happening in terms of uh, students. Uh, we, we talk about in our own youth, we were able to leave school and leave some of those stressful interactions or problematic relationships behind. And a lot of our students, they don't really have that anymore because those relationships follow them um, on their phones. Uh, so the sort of anxiety students are feeling throughout their day at school and also at home. Um, and also we talked at the middle school age how it's a, it is a good age for students to start being more independent. Um, we have a lot of families who are understandably, they want to reach their students all the time, right? They want to know if their stomachs are hurting or if they're having a headache. Um, and so we're really trying, uh, we did, I think, a, a good job this past year and are, are going to focus on it again this year of making sure that our systems at school are um, strong enough that families feel safe knowing that the nurse will call if your student is sick or the student can come to the main office to make a phone call if something is going on. Um, but those are all pieces that we feel are developmentally appropriate but are, are difficult for families who are sending their students off to school. <clears throat> so this past school year, um, right around this time actually we received notification that we, were, we got the grant from DESE. Um, and so we started planning implementation and DESE said you could, you could choose from a number of different um, pathways, I guess, to support students. Uh, we looked at the different pathways and decided to go with the Yonder Pouch um, and worked with that organization um, to start implementation, which began in November of last year. Um, and we ran it all the way through June. Um, during, before we, we, before we launched it and during that time, um, we were pretty much constantly um, considering feedback from students, staff, families, just hearing a lot of what people had to say and what we're experiencing um, with the pilot. Um, and then we were required as part of the grant to report back to the state about our efforts and kind of how, how it panned out. Um, a few of the things I talked about in May but have further developed at this point. Um, we were really pleased with the way um, that the pouch itself provided just another layer. It's a tool for students. Right? They had uh, the ability to, to kind of manage their own technology within that pouch. Some students, especially in the beginning, would carry it with them. That kind of got old after a while. They put it in their bags and, and left it in their locker. Um, also, when we talked to students, uh, they said uh, that it helped them to understand that the issue was important. It helped them to understand that the school took it seriously um, and that they were glad to have something that reminded them that it was important to keep their phone away. Um, we saw a decrease in the amount of time that we as administrators and as teachers were spending on in-school cell phone offenses. I will say we continue um, to manage a lot of outside of school um, interactions that happen and of course those tensions come into the building. But the stuff that was happening previously in school, um, we weren't managing that in real time which was a big relief um, on time. Um, and then as we and everybody else kind of gets more acquainted with some of the research around the longer term uh, challenges that students are facing with managing all of this technology. Um, we felt really good about the fact that we're, we're figuring out how we can be a piece of addressing that um, for, for families and for our school community. So going into this year, we're thinking about um, how do we take the routines and expectations that the students now know, so we're not going into a year where it's something unknown or where we're introducing it, um, and capitalize on those and make those even stronger. Um, and then thinking about those students who need the most support. So those for whom even the pouch um, was not <laughs> enough of a deterrent to keep them from really trying to access that during the day. What are, how are we supporting those students and families? It's something we're thinking about. Um, so we're really, really glad um, to be supported in continuing this into a second year. Um, we'll think longer term as the rest of the state and many communities around us are thinking like how, what is this gonna look like in our schools? long term, but we're glad to have another year where we can um, just fine tune how we, how we work this particular system in our building. 
Um, so the expectation will be essentially the same. So I know many of you are well, very well versed in, in how it works at the Galvin now. Um, but the expectation is that cell phones are off and stored in pouches. Uh, one thing we really want to focus on um, is that there are consistent consequences for students who struggle with the expectation. Um, you've heard me say many times, and I think others in the building, that really our goal is that phones are off and away. We're not searching bags. We're not, we're not trying to really closely police specifically how students are using the pouches. Um, but we do want to do a better job of when a student is having trouble with the system. How do we support that student? How do we engage families to help su support that student so that we know that they're really focused in school? So that will look like uh, families being notified even the first time a phone is out um, and needing to come pick up that phone so that we can kind of nip in the bud some of that um, kind of repeat folks who are having, having trouble keeping the phone away. Um, and in that vein, just thinking about what are the specific needs of students um, who are having a lot of either having challenges keeping their phone away or what, what, what are the different issues there that we can work with families on. Um, if you were part of conversations last year, you know um, that we do teach the children how to use the regular phone in the main office. I think many of them know that now, thanks to Yonder, so they don't think that was part of their goal. Um, but they, they are always welcome to use the office phone. I know that was a concern of parents. Um, and many of them come down and say, yeah, can I call my mom? And the answer is always yes. Um, and then continue uh, the Velcro pouch um, for students who, for, for a range of different reasons, might require access to that technology during the day. That was really successful last year, so we'll continue doing that. Um, that will look like it did last year where families can just contact us, let us know, um, and we'll set them up with that. Uh, we also will continue having the magnets in the counseling offices if, uh, if students feel like they need to access their phone at those times. So summary is we're really excited to continue. Um, we will, in our kind of welcome back to school letter, um, have information about this and then a little survey because we, we do want to just collect information about what, what, what families might be thinking about in this space um, and what they might want more information about. Um, again, it's more parents than have emailed me about most things have emailed me with recommendations for that particular book. <laughs> so I'm, I really, I think people are talking about this and they want, they want to be in conversation about how do we support our kids at this time. Um, so that's something that we'll look to just engage a lot of a lot of families around this year. Meg, I know you have a big budget. Um, mm -hmm. I just thought of one thing: the the whole I, I forgot to unlock it before I left school. I'm home. It's locked. The yeah. the where do the parents go if they're? Yep. So yeah. there at the police station um, in town, there is one. There was that they all know now. there was a, an issue with some of the officers knew and some didn't now they all know we'll remind them though with yeah. school reopening that that's there yeah. um there was one case where i just told a family let's just cut it open because they couldn't <laughs> it's okay like if you get in a jam you can call um you can go to the police station and you can call any one of us and we can guide you to make sure that you can get access to that phone great thanks mike yeah. great thanks for your thank you yeah appreciate uh, it does, does anyone have any questions yeah. I have three, but um, <laughs> one is I remember when you were here in May, you were kind of iffy on whether or not the fifth grade yeah. was going to participate. Did yeah. you decide or? Yeah, so we did talk about um, the fifth grade. There's just far fewer kids with cell phones in the fifth grade, um, and the fifth grade it's an elementary grade, and they tend to just be a little bit more like, oh, my teacher said keep it away, keeping yeah. it away. Um, but I think what we decided was we have the ability to support all kids mm -hmm. with this. Um, with the procedure and so they're gonna be sixth graders soon enough so we are gonna again give it to everybody yeah. just like this past year if you don't have a cell phone you still get one but you just kinda of put it in your locker and if you get a cell phone for Christmas or something you can use it then um, but it's easier for us to do that operationally and then it gives everyone access yeah. um, to the pouch Okay. Cool. and we'll, we do have a fifth grade orientation so we'll explain all that to the yeah. families at that point point. and then um, the office phone which must be hilarious to see the kids <laughs> dial the number. Because I don't know if my kids know how to use a normal phone. No, and they don't know the numbers. Yeah, which, they, which I don't know any numbers either. And they so don't. Look them up for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Please take a video of my kids. Every, every <laughs> but, but I just want to confirm. So anytime a kid just needs to call home for any reason, yeah. they, they can use the yes, phone. Yes, I see it happen all the time. They come in and um, the ladies in the main office are, are wonderful. And they okay. say, can I call my mom? Yep. Yeah. And then they almost always say, can you get me the different number? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <say>, yes. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And then the third thing is not a, not a question, but more of like a confirmation and a thank you. Cause I know that one of my main concerns last fall was, um, students with, um, with special needs or students with allergies or medical 
reasons of why they need to have the Velcro pouch. And from what I heard, everyone who needed a Velcro pouch got one. So yeah. I just yeah. want to say thank you for... Yeah, there's not a lot of gatekeeping around that. I think it's, if, if there's a need for it, it's something that we have. And so we're happy to accommodate that. Yeah. And I think also um, we totally understand that kids have cell phones for any range of reasons. And right. so after school, if they're available immediately to unlock their pouches because we know they're walking home, they're getting a ride, they're yeah. doing all the different things that they need to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not at all about trying to determine what students are doing outside of school in terms of technology, but just that in school there really isn't a reason for it, unless there's a reason for it, and then we'll right. get the Velcro pouch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in trying to just underline that for students, that you don't, you don't need it during mm -hmm. the day. Um, we got everything you need. Yeah. Um, and then certainly outside of school hours, yeah. families do what they need to do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm super pleased at the possibility and, and the potential of students interacting more face-to-face. -face. Yeah. And so I know I sound like an old guy right now, but <laughs> I feel like it's a skill that um, we can't help students practice enough, yeah. right? And, and um, so between that and I mean, like you said, watching kids interact with an office phone, a desk phone, is, is quite, it's quite I volunteer good. my kids if you want to take a video because that would be <laughs> well, quite good. Well, then people say, when will I ever have to do this? I was like, I have a phone on my desk that I still use, but they kind of look at me like, yeah, but you're old. Yeah. Like, they don't say that, <laughs> but I can tell them. <laughs> like, they don't envision a future where they will ever be using a regular right. phone. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's a good skill. I like it. Um, I was telling Eileen on the way down, I went to the R ART in Cambridge, and one of the things you have to do there is you just put your stuff in a Yonder mm -hmm. pouch. So it's very interesting that mm -hmm. you said you had gone to, to a comedian. To yeah. a comedian, mm -hmm. same thing. So I do think that they're becoming a little bit more common. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the things that I was kind of curious, we were saying coming down, so I thought maybe you had another question. No. Was, do you have any, there's a lot of really good anecdotal kind of reporting mm -hmm. of, like we have a sense that this is going well, like this has been down. Um, either to the state or or do you have any I know you don't police things so closely yeah. do you have any data like the number of bullying reports has decreased or yeah. like what did you report to the state I guess yeah you know the state didn't ask us for specific hard data like that they, it was more, I think what they were trying to determine is like okay all these different schools tried these different things what was what was generally the experience of that and it's funny um, number of us go to different conferences in the summer and it's the topic of you know oh, what are you doing about this how did it go um, but I, that's another thing I was talking to um, Andrew Tetral earlier today that like we knew, we want to we don't I don't have hard data to share with you right yeah. now like oh we had suspensions here and now it's here I think it is more just like oh my gosh we were like inundated with what was happening in real time in the building they were texting here they took a picture of this um, and we're, n we're we are no longer I think something to continue talking about is is the students having a <coughs> skill outside of the outside of school when they do have access to to treat each other well online or adult, all of us to to be able to do that um and what to do when you see something um that you want to report um online uh we i get we get stuff even now in the summer like oh i saw this on snapchat i'm like ah oh, it's mm -hmm. august but <laughs> so, but yes but thank you for telling me so um so i think that's something that we do i, I want to be able to come back and report to you that that one, the survey data, what we do, what we learn from families, what the experience is, versus what this past year was just a lot of real conversations and um, it almost became focus groups because we had people come in and just, um, you know, we, they had a lot of questions, concerns um, around something new. Um, but that's definitely an area that we want to collect some more hard data. And, and our, our students, yeah. too, were focus groups, um, at the, which were amazing. At the end of the year, we did all our eighth graders. Um, and kind of what they thought of it and what they thought we should do moving forward. Um, but that's something we want to do a more kind of reportable report um, survey yeah, for, that'd for be you great. all. And then just a real practical question. Do students turn in their pouch? Do they have the same yeah. one for yeah. all three years? Or what's so yes, process? theoretically, but as you can imagine, <laughs> we did collect them back at the end of the year. And <laughs> We were going through them this morning, actually. They're, and they're in a range of shape. A lot of them are usable. They've got the name, the graduation date. They took great care of them. Um, and then some we're just, we can't give back to kids. Yeah. So, um, so that's where we're in the process of figuring out how many more do we need? How do we set that up so that everybody just has it, a functioning one? Um, just middle schoolers are not the, the kindest to, to their belongings in their backpacks. So um, the wear and tear is kind of got in the way of it being like a, a something that someone can have for four years. Um, I think some will last a couple years. And then we'll let's we'll see what we need each year. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any other questions, comments? Okay, um, I have one, uh, one comment, and then two questions. 
Um, one comment is because this is being implemented at the very beginning of this year, mm -hmm. like you're doing this the first day of school, I would bet that it would go smoother this year than when you started in November of last year. Just because anytime you start a policy or start any initiative in the middle of the year, um, I imagine that that was tough and that it, it's, it, I, I think that, I think that it will be an improvement um, starting at the beginning of the yeah. year. So I think that that's like a comment I'm having. I, yeah, I, no, um, I agree. Kind of just an assumption Completely. I have that yeah. it would, it would go Most of the kids, better. it's just old hat now. They just, yeah. another thing they get at the start of the year, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I have one question for you and then one for Dr. Lyons. Um, um, I guess my question to you, I hate to put you on the spot, but would would you recommend to... Um, you know, both senior administration and the high school, would you provide, like, if you had to give your feedback, would you recommend moving this program to the high school? Um, people ask me that all the time. I think the, the high school is a very different developmental time for students, and I, um, I feel strongly about cell phones being off in a way at, at the middle school level. There's really no, almost no mm -hmm. way to argue that, that you would need them for any academic purpose. Um, I'm not sure I know as much about what they might be used for at the high school or what students' communication needs might be. I think that'd be a great conversation for the high school administration. I know there are high schools who have been involved in the Yonder pilots or other yeah. pilots. I know our high school is trying different things with, you know, cell phone hotels and, and mm. um, different ways of helping students to manage. But I think it would be an interesting conversation just developmentally. What, what could that look like as kids get older? Okay. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Lyons, you mentioned Commissioner Riley um, with that quotation. And I know that different states across the country are kind of, you know, implementing different policies and recommendations to their school systems. Um, like what, have the state guidelines changed since last year or are they pretty much the same our state, in terms of the recommendations that they're giving? So our, our state guidelines have not changed. Okay. Other states have okay. that are a little bit more aggressive with this in terms of the um, the laws that are being created or, or kind of requirements that are being created by the departments of education. And it's also other states have kind of larger, they don't have the same kind of um, governance structure yeah. that we have here in Massachusetts where every town is a, is a district unto itself, whereas in different parts of the country, you know, Houston, the Houston public school system is, is there's one superintendent for you know, 240,000 students, or you know, Los Angeles has it's one of the largest districts in the in the country. So it's a, it's a much larger kind of group of, of students, um, but there they are increasing. We're seeing more and more um, requirements for students um, to have cell phones away, right? And so, um, and Meg talked about here at the high school, a practice here at the high school. Um, is and, and we and Amy McLeod will provide any teacher that wants this and I think most teachers have this is, is they look like uh, shoe holders you know like they used to the old-fashioned used to hang on a door you know and kids put their phones in them and they're numbered and you know just to kind of get the distance alone right it gives us a little a little space and so I think it's a little different at the high school more so than at the middle school right and uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, but we're we're learning and we're watching to see what happens happening not only across the country, but we're we're thinking that when the commissioner, um, when the new commissioner comes in and, and a permanent uh, appointment, that we will hear more in this space. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for thank the presentation. Yeah. Uh, this is definitely is something that a lot of parents, you know, feel very strongly about, um, and I, I think it's something that you know is definitely on the radar of a lot of people. You know, For both sure. in terms of student behavior, but also academic outcomes. <clears throat> yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg. And Kevin, thank you for the question about the qualitative and quantitative. I think that that gives us um, a little bit something to, to think about as we are moving into year two of this work. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Joe Belanger up. And so Joe has been directing um, not only our, our kind of our payroll system, uh, but he's also kind of supporting uh, human resources as well. And so we are in year two of a, a system to keep track of the uh, positions. Uh, we're in year two of position control. And so um, I asked Joe to come in to talk a little bit about his work with position control, what this means, um, why we do, use the practice of position control, 
um, why some other districts have gotten in the weeds with positions and budget. And so we're, we're just trying to stay kind of ahead of um, st or current with practices that are going to keep us in a good st stead in regard to budget and planning um, and also kind of supporting positions and the needs of students. So I can turn it over to Joe at this point. Thank you. Great to be here. <clears throat> So we, as Doug said, we're in the beginning of our second year. Last year was a big undertaking, getting this all set up. We have about 621 positions that we have, and that does not include um, our temporary positions, so substitutes, coaches, Wakefield Academy, those do not get assigned a position number. But just in the permanent positions, we have 621. So position control just creates job slot records, um, which allow us to authorize and identify and fill any vacant positions we have. So it's essentially the budgeted positions that we have at each school that are set up in our HR and payroll system um, for the purpose of allowing not only us, but the principals in their schools to manage the positions that they have in their school. Um, it restricts the addition of new employees to the HR payroll system. So we can't just hire positions and plug them in. There has to be a position number available for them to actually go into the system. Uh, it tracks all the FTE for all the positions that we have, um, except for those temporary positions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it keeps the history, which is really important. Uh, I was talking to Meg before she came up here, and she absolutely loves it. Um, she's got, I think, 120, 130 positions uh, at the Galvin. And so for her to manage, she's like not having to remember, right, well, who was in that position last? She can just go right in and see um, you know, the history of that position uh, at her school. Um, and then it also allows us to instantly generate reporting, which is key for a lot of things. There is some uh, compliance reporting that we have to do on positions. Uh, we're working on a report, uh, a Medicaid report that we have to do, and we need to be able to quickly pull out certain positions. And having all these uh, positions in the system allows us to do that quickly and, and accurately. So what we do uh, on a regular basis is we are able to run a vacancy report um, out of the system, and this lets us know where we stand in terms of the 621 positions that we have, which ones are currently vacant. And so um, this is as of today, this is our uh, list of vacant <coughs> positions that we're obviously trying to fill in the next four weeks to get ready for school. Um, we have, you know, a handful of para positions on there, uh, as well as uh, a point five. You can see the FTE on the right hand side. Uh, the FTE of you know, each position, we have a 0.5 math teacher, we have a 0.5 MSN, we have a 0.5 pre-K position, and then the rest are all uh, pretty much uh, full-time 1.0 positions. Um, we also are able to, to do this by location. So at any time, if a principal needs to know what their positions look like, who's in those positions, we can run a report that will show them the title of the position, who's in the position currently, and we actually send them to them on a regular basis and ask them to verify to make sure that you know, we've got the right information and they have uh, accurate data that they're using and managing their account. So, <clears throat> so that's, uh, this again is run regularly and we can use this to double check that the positions are posted, that we're doing everything we can to recruit those positions um, that we need to get filled. So that's, that's the exciting world of position control. Um, from what I've heard from a lot of our principals, they absolutely love it. They, they didn't have this system prior to last year. And so trying to manage, you get to September and you spent the whole summer trying to figure out what positions you needed to fill. And, um, you know, it got a little confusing, especially with uh, positions that move around a lot. A lot of our para positions, one-to-one um, -one positions, they, they shift from one school to another. Um, so it can get a little complicated managing that, but this, this definitely has allowed us to do that um, with ease. It's a great point, Joe, and I, I can't say enough about this because um, a lot of, as student populations change, as students move into the district and as with their families, and as families come and as they might move out of the district, there's a mobility kind of rate, right, that people coming and people moving out. As that happens and the needs of students at schools change, so does the need for us to either schedule differently, schedule personnel differently, or really pay close attention, like Joe said, a, a, you know, a one-to-one. -one. So if someone moves in and they need support and they have an IEP that requires that a student have a one-to-one, -one, and then that student leave, you know, we have a one-to-one, -one. We, we have a, a person in that position. So this is where Joe works very closely with the principals and with Rosie to say, you know, 
oh, okay, there's an emerging need at this district, you know, at the school, we can move that position from point A to point B. Um, so it's, it's really helped us think very thoughtfully about student needs and about how we're managing them throughout the district. Um, and I think Joe doing this has been really amazing. It's, it's kind of a, a Herculean effort to get to where we are now. Um, but we can't thank you enough for this work, Joe. Thank and, you. And if I could just add to that, it's really also about budget control because all we all know that when we go through the budget process and we go to the town, we're always talking about number of positions. And if we're adding for new positions, what those look like. Well, we're also talking about FTEs. Sometimes we'll have to collapse positions to create something new. But this, this allows us to always work within the budget. So we know it's not necessarily who's in the positions, but the number of positions and what we can afford for that budget moving forward. So it's really making sure that we stay in line with what we were approved for. Yeah, and it allows us to manage one of the positions we do create, and, and they fluctuate, are the long-term sub positions. We do create positions for long-term subs. We essentially assign them the same position number as the person they're subbing for except the first digit changes from a three to a nine. So we can just take that nine, put a three in front of it, we know who that person is covering for. And, and those will vary based on, you know, year to year, based on who goes out on, you know, whether it's FMLA um, or, uh, you know, parental leave, um, any one of those needs that happen, whether they're out for six weeks or, you know, the entire school year, we have that position created and we have someone in there and we get to the end of the year you don't have to try to remember who was this person covering for it because the, the number there tells us exactly who they're covering for. So the other question that we often get is of the number of employees that we have, 621, that's throughout seven bargaining units, right? And so when we are negotiating contracts, it's it's actively with seven units, right? And so um, so it it's it's they're not all teachers. They're in different kind of bargaining groups from custodial to food service to clerical. Um, to our traffic supervisors, to the Wakefield Administrators Association. So there's, there's kind of a distribution. Um, but everyone working for us is in this space. And, um, and so it's, it's also helped us because if you recall, um, Amy Lehman used to ask all the time, you know, how many positions do we have open? Where are they? And so now at a moment's notice, Joe can produce this, you know, as before it would be like, okay, we'd, we'll get it to you. And, and by the time the meeting rolls around, now we can do this in a moment's notice. And like Christine said, in planning ahead and budgeting, I think it's going to be critical for us in managing staff and um, both supporting schools and students. So, and a, and a thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Any questions at all? I have a question, but I don't. Oh, sorry. No, no go ahead. You, no, you go. <laughs> so, so my question is, is most of the budgets are developed, and tell me if I'm wrong, are developed by, by building. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds like we can move uh, positions from building to building. What's the process? For that if someone leaves galvin and there's a need at dolbear but there might also still be a need at galvin and for that position how does that get negotiated how is that so i can answer that yeah. so principals um negotiate their budgets they come to um, doug and i they'll come to school committee and they discuss what the needs of their building are um, if it's program based that might have a, a different conversation. It involves Rosie. It talks mm -hmm. about special education. It might involve um, more than one school and the ages of the people in that school, of the children in that, in that program, whether they're moving from the Doyle to, to the Dole Bear. So what we do is we budget by location, but we also have to look at those programs. So we're still working within the footprint of the budget, but we know um, a one-to-one -one might be moving from Doyle to Dole Bear, so the number might have to change. We have to update it by location, but we know that we're still serving the same student. So one-to-ones, you're absolutely right, get a little bit tricky, right? Because students right. not always move. I mean, not always stay in one school. They move right. um, the by grade level. Like so the position has to move with them. But we have to look at the program in total. So ultimately, the net game might be we might actually need another para, or we might have to collapse two paras to create something else, an RBT. or or basically the needs of the students that Doug was just talking about. So the summer is really busy, particularly between Joe and Rosie. They, they meet a lot about what's happening, what's, what's moving. And if we see a resignation, is it in the para group? Is it in the teacher group? Is it in a specialist? Um, so the, as Joe was saying, this is as of today. This list probably will change tomorrow. 
or the day after because it's evolving every day, um, particularly over the summer. Um, still getting um, resignations or we're knowing about new students coming in, but it's ultimately a budget conversation because we know what we can afford. Does that answer your question? Kind of. I think I'm, I'm also a little concerned about how, how you manage that on an HR level. Because if you apply as a para for Doyle, it, and then all of a sudden the position changes to a high school para, that's a, that's a very different thing. So that's the, pos that's the description of the position. If you see a strive one-to-one -one para, yeah. you know that that's assigned to a student, okay. not a school. It'll tell you what school it's currently in, but the job description will also lead you to understand that you are assigned <clears throat> to a student. The, there are, to answer, let me, I can say more yeah. about your question. So when someone applies for an elementary position, they're usually not going to the high school, okay. right? And needs are such that, and they're so dynamic that, you know, if a position is being moved from one elementary, there's usually another opening emerging in another elementary that they could move to another elementary, right? You know, so we're not, you know, slating someone to be to work with this age group and then pulling them out of that work, out of that age group and saying, oh, good luck at the high school. And right. so it's it's not we're not doing that. Okay. And so just in regard to practice, right. but we're also not leaving students without the support they need. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I would hope. <laughs> yeah. No, it's driven so by it's, the IEPs as well. What's the requirement? So I think it's done with some pragmatic skill. Yeah. Yeah. There are other questions or comments, Eileen? Yeah, I just, I didn't know if like, like I'm looking at this list mm -hmm. and some of them are like school psychologists, obviously only a certain portion of the population is gonna have that. Like, if, do we use any kind of um, like recruiting service to try to find people that would fill these positions? Because obviously that's something that's really important mm -hmm. to have at the Greenwood for that, mm -hmm. that I'm seeing. So do we use any kind of service to try to find people or are we just kind of like, throwing the listing out there and so seeing what happens. The, the <laughs> traditional way that we post, we post on uh, educational yeah. services sites, right? Yes. And so if in really hard to fill positions, mm -hmm. we have engaged, um, you know, third party service. Third party. Yeah. And so we have done that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, and we really, so we've, we've moved in that direction, yeah. but we actually ended up, we, we did that when we were trying to fill a very difficult to fill high school science position. Yeah. And then we ended up finding someone in the last minute. Like, I'm just like yeah. looking at this list and you said yeah. it changes every day. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, when do we hit the panic button that we don't have a school psychologist <laughs> in there or a one-to-one -one for that kid? Like, when do we hit that button that we're like, woo, this is not. Woo. So. We, Are we panicking we on August panic. 6th? We, yeah. we don't so panic. So the school psychologist okay. <laughs> position a week ago wasn't on that list. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It, it wasn't even on there a few days ago. Okay. So, like, it, as, as Christine said, it changes all the time. Yeah. So, you know, if we had a position sitting on there for months, we'd be concerned. That's when you But panic. for the most okay. part, these positions, you know, they're, again, we, we get, it's a, our resignations happen in June. Yeah. Some in July. And we'll then obviously you start to see... As we fill positions, some positions yeah. open up again. Okay. Um, and so, um, I mean, I've only been here a short time, but it hasn't seemed like, I mean, I, I, in fact, I think um, filling half positions has probably been harder than filling yes. any other position, yeah. you know? Oh, okay. So, um, you know, for the most part, I haven't seen a real issue with us trying to fill uh, most of the positions. And as Doug said, if we did, we would start looking at other avenues. Okay. This cool. is pretty yeah. typical for August. Yeah, you know, it's the time that people um, are looking at d different yeah. districts, mm -hmm. but we are um, always going to make sure that students are getting the services they need, right. whether we have to contract that out or fill it in FTE. Okay, so that's what, if, if a kid has, I'm sorry, I'm asking so many no, it's questions, okay. but it's, it's um, now that I'm seeing this list, it makes yeah. me curious. So if a kid has a one-on-one -on, -one on their IEP, mm -hmm. but we haven't filled that position, that's when you would contract, contract that yeah. out. Okay. We could contract out. We could or transfer reassign someone, within. reassign someone from within. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. just in regard to practice, so that people know, and I know Kevin knows this because he's he does this every day, right? So we, so when we do this in in practice, we have kind of a plan A, a plan B, plan C mm -hmm. for really every one of these positions. Okay. Right. And so, you know, plan A is to post, and we get someone terrific um, that really adds value to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's plan A, mm -hmm. right? And then plan B is if we can't find someone who might fit that bill, uh, maybe we think about reassigning someone within or sharing the responsibility or kind of something like that, right? Or, or maybe hiring an interim 
So, we, and then plan C might be, you know, trying to have one or two people kind of backfill a position. And so your question started off with the school psych position. Mm -hmm. So for example, school psychs test and they counsel, Yeah. right? So, you know, Rosie knows, uh, Rosie has kind of a master list of, of everyone and their testing needs, right? So, and what, you know, when their kind of annual dates are or their reeval dates are. So if we need to do testing and we need a school psych, and we can't fill that position, but let's say um, we have an adjustment counselor filling that role, mm -hmm. um, whereas it once was filled by uh, a school psych who both tested and counseled, right? So plan B might be uh, we have an adjustment counselor or a social worker, and then we have to pick up testing through contracted services or someone else in the district. Okay. So, and that's a long answer. Yeah, no, and I, I don't mean I, to press, because I know this was just no, about no, no. this cool new list, the Lehman yeah. list, as we'll yeah, call yeah. it. Um, that we have now, which is great, <laughs> but um, it's just it like is pinging a lot of questions yeah. in my mm -hmm. head of like, what do we do now? Yeah. No, to make you feel so. better. A lot of these positions, they're they're in the work. They're like the people work. are interviewing. I, I, people I are have applying. no doubt yeah. they're in the work. Yeah. So I'm just, <laughs> there's I'm, some leads. We're not. Yeah. Just, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, starting from scratch. I yeah. think a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, it is always the August, uh, yeah. you know, the way it goes. Like we have yeah. last minute um, this just things opening up and work. Okay. But the principals do a great job of trying to get it get fully staffed. Are we are we using this system to track turnover rates by position or by by unit or by Ooh. school? We haven't done that yet. And done any exit interviews to see like if there's or, or trends or. So so we have done some exit interviews. Um, you know, um, a lot of times when people are leaving, they will reach out and we will have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation today with the school psych who's leaving, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it was a wonderful conversation, and it was. You know, we learn a lot, right? Yeah. And so we, there's always a takeaway. Um, but we are doing it, but we haven't formalized that in regard to tracking um, individual positions and or or kind of groups of positions. Right. Yeah. Okay. But I'm sure the more we use it, the more we could do yeah. that. The longer we're using it, we'll have more data. But right. that, that, that data is in there, and it's keeping a history. It's keeping the history of the dates that people were in a position. So there's a lot of data that you can actually pull out of uh, the system. That's great. Thanks. And you'll see ISPs on the list more than anything because they're mm -hmm. usually working towards another goal, maybe becoming a teacher or licensed in some other area, or the program has changed. So that's usually what we see most on the list at this mm -hmm. time of, of year is most of the changes. Steven had a question. Oh, Steven, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, no, that's okay. I kind of had a, a comment, not as much a question, but I just want to, you know, say thank you to Joe and, and Christine also. Um, I know that we've sort of seen this sort of um, HR, this as a need for sort of HR within our district. Um, I'm really appreciating what I, I can only imagine must be a time savings at the administration level of every building. Um, this has to be something that sort of uh, principals and administration is looking. Um, they do this by hand. They kind of do it, you know, uh, year after year. And so this has to be a benefit to them. Um, and then also, Christine, the line that you draw to budget um, and how it sort of keeps us within our lanes. And, and I'm really appreciating that. Um, also, sort of, Melissa, what you said is, is sort of the unintended uh, rewards of something like this. Once we start to collect data, what can we start to do with it? Things that weren't necessarily thought of on day one, I I believe we'll see sort of um, additional rewards um, on, in like tier one or tier two, tier three, sort of going down the road, whether that's sort of trending um, or seeing where positions go or, or how to fill something, seeing pattern recognition and having people in place um, before you actually physically see the need and being able to anticipate. Um, so I, I think it's great. I started to say, I wanted to ask like what um, what is the problem that we're solving for? But uh, Joe, you you kind of already sort of wrote that there, because I'm always curious when we have a new tool, what are we solving for? Um, but I can see it. So um, thank you so much for putting this together, for finding the time. Um, I I think it's a, a benefit for the district, and, and appreciate the time you spend putting it together. Thank you. Are there any other comments or Melissa? Last one. Um, is it is it a proprietary? system or are we buying this from someone? It's actually part of the payroll and HR system we already have. It just wasn't being used. Okay. Um, I came from another school district before yeah. coming here and we used it extensively there. So I had the experience with it. Um, we had a, a, a lot more schools, a lot more positions. So uh, it was definitely a big benefit there. But um, I knew there was, you know, the ability to have the same benefit here 
And I know Meg, um, the school district, she was in before and used it as well. So when she heard we were rolling it out, she was all excited that she was going to be able to use that to manage things. So. All right, thank you. Great. I don't know. We, we talk about MUNIS, and that's our financial management system. And this is a module of MUNIS that we're using. It's the HR module. But I know you, you hear me use the word encumbrances a lot. So these are the, the amount of positions we have. We know who's filling them and what they cost. So that fills that encumbrance column, so we know we don't go over budget. Because this, these FTEs, those 621 positions, are 80% of this budget. Mm -hmm. So that, that is so critical for us to make sure that we are in line to what we can afford. And there are a lot of modules in that system that weren't, we weren't using. And, and mm -hmm. so not costing us any more money. We're just starting to use yeah. what was available to mm -hmm. us. You know, salary tables, putting the, the amount of money in there. Yeah. It used to be a manual process of keying everybody's new salary in in the summertime. Um, and now we use tables and what would take, you know, two or three days to key everybody's new salary in takes us about 15 minutes now um, by putting that in place. So, yeah. um, we, you know, as we move forward, we're just kind of keep looking at there's other features we're not using that will roll out. And, you know, making sure, again, it makes sense to do it, not just to do it to do it, but... Um, that makes sense. And so far, most of the things we have put in place um, have, have saved a lot of time. That's great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the thank presentation. You. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yes, great. So it's, it's great having Joe here because in a short amount of time, we've gone from, it's probably one of, our, one of the areas where we've improved most is kind of human resources, um, and finance management, and one of the primary reasons for that improvement is Joe, right? And so we've gone from, you know, really talking about areas where, that we need to improve. Now we've kind of become a model. Joe has worked in with other districts where he's gone to other districts, get a call from the superintendent. Could Joe come over and help our, our staff? Yes. And Joe comes back, and then we'll have teams come here and observe as well. So, um, it's it's we're kind of trending in the right direction so more to follow on that thank you so much joe Thanks. appreciate it next up on my agenda if it's okay to move yeah, of course and so next up is um the employment contract for the director of special education um so we are seeking a, a motion um to approve uh, to approve um rosie galvin's contract uh, move, move that the school committee approve the administrative employment contract for the director of special education as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing no discussion, uh, we'll move into a roll call vote. Okay, Ms. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Fontanella? Yes. Ms. Colloran? I'm going to abstain. What? I'm going to abstain. abstain. Oh, you're abstaining. Mm -hmm. Um, and Dr. Piscadlo? Yes. And Mr. Ringles? Yes. Okay, so a vote of four yes and one abstention. Uh, this roll call vote passes. The contract is approved. Thank you so much. Um, so next is the kind of the end of year FY24 financial report by Christine. So I, I touched upon it um, before when I was um, talking about my business reports. I just kind of want to highlight a few things again. Um, 24 was the first year that we were really talking about uh, reimbursing from revolving accounts. So we got a lot of pushback when we went to the town for the past two budgets now about looking at those balances and making sure that we're um, spending down appropriately. So um, I know I already talked about the balance, about $24,000 that's going back to the town, but we also included in that um, chargebacks to the revolving accounts, to the athletics, to the um, building rental account, to the Wakefield Academy um, account, and to the Doyle Preschool account. So um, there's still um, uh, a balance in Wakefield Academy and probably the Doyle that is still uh, roughly about a million dollars, but that was done intentionally also because next year for 25, in order to balance 25's budget, I know I'm kind of bringing you back to March now, but in order to do that, we um, had to make sure that those revolving accounts, the chargeback next year is gonna be over $300,000. So it's almost double what we did in 24. So we're really thoughtful of that. There was a lot of conversations. There was a lot of 
um, you know, dialogue in the budget book about what we're going to do for the next four years. I know, Stephen, you were talking about in finance and facilities about this being a, um, a goal for a school committee for the next four years. But we're really spending now on those, but we're doing it thoughtfully and we're doing it over the next four years. So 25 is going to be over 300,000, but it's going to decrease um, after that for 26, 27, and 28. So we are returning a little bit of money. It's $24,000. We were thoughtful about that as well to what we could kind of, what we could uh, afford to give back to the town. Um, but um, next year, you know, I just want to caution about what that revolving account conversation is going to be because those amounts are going to be larger in 25 than they were in 24. But um, we balanced 24. We're in good shape. We have um, a little over $64,000 worth of purchase orders going into 25. Um, but we're going to have some conversations. We're going to talk about out of district tuitions next year. Those numbers are increasing. Um, so, you know, 24 is over and we're looking for 25. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other? Uh, just a, a very quick update. Um, we had a traffic safety meeting. If you recall that there was a, a very serious bike accident on the corner of, of farm. Um, and so we had a, we met um, with the, um, with Officer Anderson, Chief Scorey, uh, Steve Mayo, uh, members of, of um, Bond and, and Left Field to talk about what we can do to basically really help support um, the traffic and the speed at which people are moving. And so we came away with a plan and we, we kind of met to, to formalize that plan. So um, the town is going to be working um, to put in uh, speed tables, which are like the speed bumps, and they are um, kind of temporary. They won't be put in permanently. Um, so we're gonna put uh, two on farm, um, one over by Old Nahant, and one just, uh, just past uh, Woodville. <coughs> we're also going to, to kind of put one um, on Hemlock as well to really slow, slow people down. Um, we also, in the process, um, have, we've worked out funding through the project um, to get another traffic supervisor to support students at the high school crossing at the crosswalk. Um, and so we feel like um, that's really signif a significant change um, and we're working on signage as well. But I just want the, the committee and the public who might be watching to let them know that, um, you know, we've, we've gotten your feedback and I think that this response is um, significant and I think it will be helpful to our students and our families. So that's it for me. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, next item are the chair's comments. Um, I don't really have much uh, to say or give an update, uh, but uh, one thing I do want to say is um, summer is a very relaxing time, very exciting time for all of us, um, but um, definitely for on the school committee side, we're all on vacation different times, you know, obviously all seven of us aren't at the table, um, so it, it kind of makes it a little more difficult uh, to get some business done um, as opposed to the regular school year where we've got a more regular ebb and flow. Um, but we're at August 6th and um, being an educator myself, like I know that this is the time where like we're really ramping up. Um, and I know all of our administrators and teachers are working really hard right now uh, to prepare for the school year, which is coming really, really fast. Um, so I just want to say um, enjoy the rest of your summer. Like I, I didn't mean to freak, I didn't mean to bum everyone out. But, uh, but, yes. But, um, but, I, but I do want to d definitely, um, you know, say that, you know, because uh, for, for those people that aren't in the field, August is really where it ramps up. And there's a lot, as you saw with that list right now, we've got to hire all these positions. Um, you know, you know, the buildings are being prepared. Uh, this is really, um, you know, an intense month. Like, it's not like the first day of school happens and it's like, boom, there's mm -hmm. a lot of preparation. Um, so I want to thank everyone, you know, teachers, administrators for all the work that you're doing there. Moving on to subcommittee reports. Um, finance and facilities, Tom Markham is not here. Who's on that subcommittee? Oh, I don't think anyone here. It's um, Pete. It's Pete. I think it's, it's Pete. Somebody. No, it's not Pete. Yeah, it's 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 Pete. Ye
me. Right? I, I haven't Steve? met in the last week. Okay, all right. <laughs> so no report. No. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, labor and personnel, Kevin Piscatola. We have not me. met in the last week either. We do plan a meeting uh, fairly soon once Mr. Markham gets back. Okay. Um, we'll be finding a meeting time to meet and uh, get things going for that. Okay. Uh, student services, Eileen. Uh, we have also not met in the past week. I forgot that we had a meeting last week. Um, but that reminds me, Judy, you'll be getting an email tonight about a meeting, an upcoming meeting that will be happening next So. week. Right, not this week, but next week. We're, week, but we're, next we're week. gonna have a meeting to plan. To Plan. And we'll meet with Deidre, but the week after that, week we after meet with that. the superintendent. Yes. 21st or the 22nd? 22nd. 22nd. I knew that. Great. Um, policy and communications. Pete Davis is um, not here. We did not meet. You have not met since. Okay. Last week. Okay. Um, are there any liaison reports? Okay. Um, I do have a meeting with the Environmental Sustainability C uh, Committee on Thursday night. I did not, they actually had a retreat on Sunday I was not able to make, um, but I do know that um, they are, you know, interested in making sure that um, the buses are filled with the, the total amount of seats that we have, that we can get as close to 100% as possible. Um, so I'll probably ask at the next meeting, you know, how mm -hmm. many, like where that, happy where to, that number is. Happy to provide that, that data. That Great. Um, okay, uh, next. Item on the agenda, future dates and agenda items. The next school committee meeting is going to be in two weeks on August 20th uh, at seven o'clock. And um, uh, are there, is there anyone that wants to propose an agenda item for that meeting? Seeing none right now, um, I suggest that you email um, Stephen Ingalls for that. I'm just filling in his chair, but you can, you can see the angles for any uh, agenda items that you want to put on the next meeting or, or future meetings. Okay. Um, and then the next item on the agenda, are there any comments by any member of the school committee? Seeing none, I have none either. So I think we have a motion to adjourn. Move that the school committee adjourn its meeting of Tuesday, August 6, 2024. Second. Uh, Eight oh six. Discussion. We'll do a roll. Call. <laughs> Miss Quinn. Yes. Mr. Pontanella. Yes. Miss Caller. Yes. Doctor Piscadlo. Yes. Mr. Ringles. Yes. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Finally. <laughs> you yeah, like that? Can you please?